Hello everybody, my name's Jay. I'm one of the expert OET teachers here at E2 Language. In this live class, we're going to look at the new OET 2.0 Reading Part C test. What we're gonna do specifically is I'm gonna show you what this test looks like and just show you what the rules are. Then we're going to learn a method for how you can answer the questions successfully. Then we're going to do some real practice and I'll put you under time pressure. And then finally at the end, at the end we'll look at some answers or the answers I should say. Now, all of the material that you're about to see is taken from the official free sample of the occupationalenglishtest.org website. I've been given permission to use this uh, for training purposes, so I thank the OET for giving me that permission. So let's get started. I'm just going to give you a quick overview of Reading Part C. So Reading Part C is combined with Reading Part B. And those two subtests will go for 45 minutes in total. But as I said, you should be spending approximately two minutes on each question. Or maybe I didn't say that. You should be spending two minutes on each question approximately. Reading Part C consists of two longish semi-academic texts. Okay, and you'll get two sets of eight multiple choice questions. And each question will have four answer options. So let me describe the test to you. This is what the paragraphs look like. You see that they are not labeled paragraph one, two, or three. They are just paragraphs. And the questions look like this. What you can see from the questions is in which paragraph you should be reading. For example, question number eight tells you to read in the second paragraph. Question number nine tells you also to read in the second paragraph. Question number seven uses a keyword Mary, which you'll find in the first paragraph, for example. So you know how to make your way through the text using the questions. Okay, so you won't waste time reading the wrong paragraph. All right, let's have a look at the method for reading part C because there is a method to this, this subtest. What you need to do first is read the paragraph. What you don't want to do is read all of this information and confuse yourself, okay? Before you've read this. Remember this is a reading test. There's no way to trick your way to the right answer. It really does require you to read and understand the paragraph. If you're spending too much time, time trying to work out the answer options and which one's longer and which, it's a complete waste of time. What you need to do is this, read the paragraph, understand it fully without the distraction of the question and the answer options. Fully grasp what the paragraph says. Get a complete understanding of it, okay? Remember you got two minutes and that paragraph's only, I don't know, 100 and maybe 100 words, so it's not very long. After you've fully understood the paragraph, then turn your attention to the question and answer options. Read them carefully because you've got a full understanding of the paragraph, you should be able to then say, okay, it's not A, it's not B, oh, C looks good. Okay, it's not D, aha, uh -huh, it must be C. And then you may wanna reread. So some answer options, three of the answer options, will either contradict what was said in the text, or they will not be mentioned at all. Which leaves you with one answer option that will say the same thing as the text or as the paragraph, but in different words, okay? So let me say that again. Three of those answer options will contradict what's written in the text. They'll say something else, something other, or they just won't be mentioned in the text at all. One of them, the correct answer option, will be mentioned in the text, but it will be written in different words, okay? They'll use synonyms and uh, they'll structure it a little bit differently. It'll say the same thing, but in different words. So keep that in mind, that's absolutely critical. So that's the method. Let's do some practice. I wanna put you under some time pressure here. I'm actually gonna, there's little timers on the screen for two minutes. I want you to do this. I don't want you to go, oh, I'll just skip through the video and do that later. Let me check the answers. Try to do it because on test day, you, you, you're going to feel intense pressure, intense time pressure, and your ability to read clearly will be compromised because of your anxiety and the different emotions that you feel on test day. So this will be a really good opportunity for you to look and focus and read the paragraph, understand it, concentrate on that first, 
then read the question, the answer options, select the right answer. So let's do it. I'll take you through um, all eight questions and then we'll look at the answers at the end. Before you continue though, if you're watching this on YouTube, click that subscribe button so every time we release a new video, video, you'll be notified so you can watch it. And also feel free to like this video and leave a comment, okay, if you want more. All right, your turn guys, let's do it, let's practice.
Cool, and that is it. You've done the first part of reading part C. Remember, you're now going to have eight more questions. We won't do them now, but in the real exam, that's what will happen. So how did you go? Um, hopefully you wrote your answers down on a piece of paper because we're about to look at the answers. But hopefully that gave you a very good experience of what test day will be like, okay? Of course, it will be much more intense on test day because you're not sitting at home all comfortable and relaxed. You'll be surrounded by uh, a lot of strange people. There'll probably be noises in the room, people scratching, sniffing, all sorts of stuff going on. So it's very imperative that you, or it's imperative, I should say, that you maintain concentration, focus on reading and comprehending and understanding those paragraphs because that is what it's all about, okay? Cool. Okie dokie. So let's have a look at the answers now. So number seven, what point is made about the death of a female patient called Mary? A, it was entirely preventable. That is the point of this paragraph. It comes from the entire paragraph, but there is a specific sentence there that says, what followed was a tragedy made worse by the fact that it need not have occurred at all. In other words, it was entirely preventable. Number eight, what is meant by the phrase effort substitution in the second paragraph. Now, this is a type of question that you're going to see. It's called vocabulary in context. There'll be a phrase, a, wo a single word or a phrase in bold and underlined in the question, and it'll be the same in the text. So you can locate it very quickly. Now, you can't just look at the word and then choose the answer because oh, I know the synonym for this one. It comes from the context of what was said before it and possibly what was said after it, okay? So yes, you need to read around the particular word or phrase. In this case, the answer is C. If it's substitution means staff focus their attention on a limited number of issues. And you'll see here it says, in particular, it says, in other words, people concentrate on the areas that are, that are being incentivized but neglect other areas, okay? So they, they focus their attention on a limited number of issues. Okay, number nine, the answer is A, by quoting Dixon Woods in the second paragraph, the writer shows that the professor understands why healthcare employees have to make certain choices. Maybe you chose, uh, there was a tricky one here, which is B. Maybe you chose B, but B is really strange. It says doubts whether reward schemes are likely to put patients at risk. It's kind of odd, but maybe you chose that one. It's a good distractor. This one came from this part of the paragraph here. It's not even necessarily conscious neglect. Okay, so she understands why they have to make certain choices. People have only a limited amount of time, so it's inevitable that they focus on areas that are measured and rewarded. So that's the answer there and why it is. Number 10, what point is made about checklists in the third paragraph? D, the information recorded on them does not always reflect reality. Specifically, there's a part that says, nurses would use the lists as box ticking exercises. They would tick the box to say the patient had their antibiotics when there were no antibiotics in the hospital, for example. In other words, the information recorded on the checklists does not always reflect Reality, what happened in reality. Number 11, what problem is mentioned in the fourth paragraph? Well, the text says not only does she find differences in approaches between hospitals, but also between units and even between shifts. Something about standardization is not good. In other words, D, a lack of consistency is the problem found in the fourth paragraph. Number 12, what point about patient safety is the writer making by quoting Dixon Woods's comparison with climate change? Okay, so why did the author mention this quote about climate change? Let's read it. It says, Dixon Woods compares the issue of patient safety to that of climate change in the sense that it is a problem of many hands with many actors, each making a contribution towards the outcome 
and there is difficulty in identifying where the responsibility for solving the problem lies. In other words, B, it isn't clear who ought to be tackling the situation. Number 13, the writer quotes Dixon Woods's reference to intensive care beds in order to illustrate a fundamental obstacle. So here, the whole text here is talking about a fundamental obstacle. A, C, and D are incorrect. So if you eliminate, eliminated A, C, and D, you would have been left with B, and that is in fact the general idea from this paragraph. What we're starting to see though is something a little bit different. We're starting to see questions that relate to the author's attitude and why did the author include this information? Or what was the point of this, for example? This is a different type of question that we've seen in the other OET test. Here, we're reading almost between the lines to try to find attitudes and opinions of uh, of, of the, the person being quoted, but also why the author quoted that person in the first place. So it gets pretty tricky, right? Number 14, what difference between healthcare and engineering is mentioned in the final paragraph? This was really hard. It says here in the paragraph, there's no formal language of design in healthcare. Do we understand what the need is? Do we understand what the requirements are? Can we think of a range of concepts we might use and then design a solution and test it before we put it in place? There has to be a way of getting our two sides, that is engineering and healthcare, talking. Only then will we be able to prevent tragedies. The answer is D. The approach they take to deal with challenges is the difference between healthcare and engineering. What score did you get? You might want to put your score into the comments below. If you're enjoying this video, if you're finding it helpful, please click like and leave a comment and subscribe to the channel so it boosts so more and more people can see this sort of stuff. Uh, cool, how did you go? How did you go? I'm interested. Okie dokie, if you struggled, if you found that hard, or if you're nervous or worried about test day, which is completely natural by the way, you should prepare for your test because preparation will give you confidence Confidence comes from knowing and understanding and, well, being prepared. So if you do need to prepare, check out e2language.com. We're a premium preparation provider trained by the OET, and you can sign up for free. And if you want, you can upgrade your account for tutorials, writing feedback, access to the live group classes, uh, lots of methods, lots of practice tests, practice questions, etc. There's heaps of stuff on the website for you. So do check out e2language.com. Thanks very much for watching. I hope it was helpful and I'll see you soon for more OET practice.